we pick up with the trials of Jesus. And yes, I do mean trials because it wasn't just one as we often think. It was actually six. Three at the hand of the Jews and three at the hands of the Romans. And what I find really interesting is the method that the Jews used to try to convict Jesus. And we pick that up in Matthew chapter 26. Verse 59 says, The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know that whenever I'm accused of something, my first response is defense. It goes something like this. Well, I didn't do it like that. I mean, you guys just don't understand. It was really like this. You don't have all the details. It was really so-and-so that did that. See, and I know this isn't just common to me, because even back in Genesis chapter 3, when the very first sin is recorded, what is Adam's response whenever he gets caught? A defense. It was the woman that you put here with me. And I know that's how most of us would probably respond whenever we are accused of something, whether rightfully or not. But let's look at how Jesus responded to it. Picking up in that same, in the next verse, it says, Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. He stayed silent in the midst of all these accusations that they were bringing against him. And I can't help but just look back at Isaiah 53, verse 7, that says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. See, if anyone had a reason to defend themselves, to prove that they were innocent of everything that he was being accused of, it was Jesus. And yet he stayed silent so that we could be healed. And then we flip back to this after he's gone through the, the process of all these six different trials. Finally, he goes back to Pilate, the head Roman guy in the area. And Pilate says, all right, I'm going to turn you over. At the pressure of the Jews, I'm going to turn you over to be flogged and crucified. And you see, to understand flogging, we have to understand this is a few-step process. The first is that they would have taken off all of Jesus' outer garments and left him in basically the equivalent of his underwear. And then they would have strapped him to a post similar to this, one that had shackles on it that they would have tied to his wrists and to his ankles probably too, so that he couldn't move too much. And then that's where the real, real horror becomes. They take a weapon like this called a flagrum. And I don't know how well you can see this, but this device was created as a tool to be able to pull the flesh off the back of whoever it is that they were punishing. See, the Roman soldiers would take turns swinging it at the person on the post, beating him constantly. There are sharp rocks and metal balls on here that give it the weight and the tearing that it needs to cut into the skin. And after so many beatings, Jesus would have been ragged, torn open on his back and sides and thighs and arms, every part of his exposed body, bleeding horribly. And yet, this is just the beginning. Because after this happened, after Jesus was beaten to almost not being recognizable, then the Roman soldiers decided they were going to take him inside the palace. And they stripped off his clothes once again. And they put him, as he's sitting down, kneeling down right there, they put a purple robe on him signifying royalty. And then they put a crown of thorns and pushed it onto his head to the point where it was cutting through his scalp and making him bleed. And then they put a scepter 
which is basically just a three foot wooden stick that the Romans would have used to help keep their lower subjects in line. And they put that in his hand. And they bowed down to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And the great thing about this, the crazy thing about this, is that this is exactly what Jesus should have been getting. The crown, the purple robe, the staff signifying royalty and rulership, the bowing down of people. And yet the Romans twisted it and mocked him using it. And then they took it took the rod from him and they started to beat him over the head with the same rod that was symbolizing his rulership. Guys, I can't even imagine exactly what that must have been like for him. And yet he endured all of that for us. I want to go back one more time to Isaiah chapter 53, but this time I want to go to verse 5. It says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And one other spot I want to flip to real quick, it's 1 Peter chapter 2, and it's going to be verse 22 where it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Guys, but what Jesus did by bearing these beatings, he brought healing. Emotional, physical, mental, but most importantly of all, spiritual healing. By his stripes we are healed. God bless.